topic I'm speaking on is, is fast acting, ultra short acting insulins and let's throw some light on this newer group of insulins that we have. So the objective of developing a new mealtime insulin is to target or get more physiological action from the insulin. So one aspect is improving the postprandial glucose, possibility of flexible mealtime dosing. So very often the dilemma of should be really dose before the meals in a lot of situations, special conditions, we would like to have an insulin that we can dose immediately after the meal time and get similar or better results. And improving the profile of course for insulin pump users. So we need more rapid absorption, faster onset of action, leading to greater potential for early glucose loading. So designing an ultra fast acting insulin, there have been various attempts at improving on the existing insulins. And when we talk about this, this is the purview of all the work that's been going on in the field of newer fast acting insulin. So you have in terms of at the administration level of insulin using a sprinkler needle which may fasten the action of insulin using pulmonary or aerosol insulins we know the story uh, about that. In terms of formulations addi additives to the insulin can change so whether use of EDT or citric acid has been trying magnesium, bio chaperone insulins with other biological products which make the insulin get absorbed faster and use of addition of niacinamide which is what has been done in the faster acting asthma. And then at the injection site itself, even simpler procedures like application of heat may actually make the insulin work faster and usage of hyaluronidase or teprostenil have been tried and are currently under, under uh, development phase for newer fast acting insulins by various companies involved in this field. So let's look at how do we curb the meal time speaks with ultra fast acting insulin and focus being on what is now available which is TS fast acting as part. Uh, let's look at the left shift in pharmacology there and the clinical development of this TS. So post mental spikes in glucose are part of the normal physiological process. We know that we don't have a glucose profile which is flat. You have the spikes which is for graphic presentation only we show you as three spikes. We know we eat and indulge more than thrice daily and you're going to be having multiple spikes through the day. And this each spike in fact is further propensated in patients with diabetes. So you normally have physiological spikes in people with diabetes. You get much worsening of these postprandial spikes. So complications of this postprandial glycemic spikes is increased risk of retinopathy, increased keratin and tima media thickness, independent risk factor for macrovascular disease. We've known that from the early studies in impaired glucose tolerant patients, the link between postprandial hyperglycemia and cardiovascular poor outcomes. Decreased myocardial blood flow, uh, blood volume and blood flow and the direct causation of postprandial spikes with oxidative stress, inflammation and endothelial dysfunction. So effect of postprandial hyperglycemia, as you can see here, the postmenal hyperglycemia through various mechanisms, whether it's protein kinase C activation or glucose auto oxidation, is going to lead to aspects of increased hypercoagulability, vascular motor function damage, eventually leading to endothelial damage and presence of micro and macrovascular disease. The association between postprandial glucose and cardiovascular mortality has been established to various long term studies, DECODE and the Gonzaga study are some of the popular ones. DECODE has been quoted very often in terms of connect between postprandial hyperglycemia and poor cardiovascular outcomes. So what the DECODE study showed many, many years back in fact is that at any level of fasting blood glucose, higher the postprandial level, worse the outcome in terms of poor cardiovascular uh, uh, long-term outcome. So whether, and this has been adjusted for age, center sex, cholesterol, look at, look at all multivariate factors. At any given level of fasting, whatever your postprandial level is, higher the postprandial value, worse the outcome. We are also now beginning to look at the concept of one hour postprandial hyperglycemia, and this has been emerging. Why? There is clear evidence that one hour postprandial hyperglycemia may in fact be more dangerous. There is clear link between one hour postprandial glycemia to increased arterial stiffness, increased left ventricular mass, increased left ventricular diastolic dysfunction, uh, which we now recognize as the uh, preserved ejection fraction that we see, endothelial dysfunction secondary to acute hyperglycemia induced oxidative stress, and all the postprandial hyperglycemia leading to postprandial hypertriglyceridemia, which we know has been spoken about, but now there is renewed interest in looking at postprandial triglycerides as a marker for cardiovascular risk factor. Recommendations from the IDF guidelines on postprandial glycemic control. So the question was, is post-meal hyperglycemia harmful? Fortunately, in, in India, we've always been looking at postprandial hyperglycemia and been focused on that. We know that in the West, looking at postprandial has been a more recent uh, way of looking at things. 
till few years back, the larger recommendations in, in the Western population was only looking at pre-meal sugars and completely ignoring the postprandial sugars. Today, we know that unless you really target the postprandial glucose, not only you're going to get less patients to your metabolic control, uh, your target control, but also you don't know what is being missed in terms of poor long-term cardiovascular outcome. So postprandial hyperglycemia can lead to substantial short and long-term consequences, and the recommendation says post-meal hyperglycemia is harmful and should be addressed more often than it has been in the past. What are the target recommendations? The ADA ESD, what exactly is the postprandial time that you should be looking at glycemia? So some of the bodies has been very specific. Some have given it as a target range. So you look at the ADA ESD and it still says about one to two hours. So what is the right time to check postprandial glucose? It gives you between one to two hours. A little arbitrary, but that's what uh, they are listing it as. The IDF also goes ahead and says one to two hours. The ACE is saying two hours post-glycemia. The Canadian Diabetes Association says two. The RSSDI also has followed suit and is talking about one to two hours uh, in the newer recommendations which are going to be released soon. So postprandial glycemic surge of common Indian foods. Now this is an interesting paper. Uh, and in terms of what we think, what kind of food causes an impact on postprandial, this is quite a revelation. So you look at what is happening at, uh, with different food items. And you look at the 60 minute, which is actually the peak time, and then of course the two hour data. You look at chapati and dal, which you might have th thought is absolutely innocent and doesn't affect. You see the huge surge. You see in one what is happening with dosi, dosa and chutney, idli and chutney, pongal, upma. In fact, I'm very happy to see that puri sabji that we like to indulge in once in a while is not really impacting your one hour postprandial glucose. So I don't know if Sanjay Agarwal is here. We both are culprits very often in catching puri bhaji. So Sanjay, we are, we are safe. You're not doing bad for our sugars. Ultra fast acting insulin. So in terms of what really is the action profile, now, what's happening from the normal pancreas, how insulin is released is, is what you see, the blue line there, the fast release and the fast decrease in its in peak action of normal physiological insulin. But for the longest time, we had only regular human in, insulin, and we can see the slow onset of action, uh, action lasting from six to eight hours, with a peak at about two to three hours. And then you had rapid acting insulin coming in, shifting uh, the profile to the left, getting a faster peak, but yet not close to the physiological insulin profile that we desire for. So ultra-fast acting insulin like FIASP is getting something closer. It's still not there in terms of what the physiological insulin peak is, but it's getting closer to in terms of faster onset of action and much more area under the curve as I'll show in the first 30 minutes of its uh, injection. So ultra-fast acting insulin provides more physiological profile, quicker onset of action, advantage of post-meal dosing, dosing flexibility in some situations, slightly better approach for, towards physiological insulin usage, more effective postprandial control, and of course, faster the insulin onset of action and shorter the uh, action is going to be always better for use in insulin pump devices. So let's see the shift in, in the pharmacology of this. So pharmacokinetic onset of exposure, there's a pooled analysis of six studies in this you see the PK profile for insulin as part, and then you compare it to the PK profile for fast-acting insulin. In yellow, what you clearly see is the much earlier onset of exposure. So in terms of onset of appearance, it's five minutes almost earlier in terms of, um, when you look at the early exposure and area under the curve, you see in the first 30 minutes, it's, it's almost double the amount in the first 30 minutes that you're getting area under the curve of the PK profile for FIASP insulin. So twice as fast onset of appearance in the bloodstream of FIASP as compared to ASPART. Two-fold higher insulin exposure within the first 30 minutes. When you talk about insulin exposure, again, in terms of um, the various uh, treatment profiles and treatment differences between FIASP and ASP, you again get similar total and maximal exposure, but you get, again, much faster peaking of action for FIASP as compared to ASPART. So fast-acting insulin as part, if I have to summarize the PK profile for that, compared with insulin as part, fast-acting insulin has twice as onset, uh, twice as fast onset of appearance in the bloodstream, two-fold higher insulin exposure within the first 30 minutes. And what about its pharmacodynamic profile? So we look at the glucose insulin infusion rate and compare that for insulin as part and fast-acting insulin. You again see in terms of onset of action almost five minutes earlier is what you're getting, the, the preferred action of FIASP. Um, Early glucose lowering effect, again, you see area under the curve much better for FIASP as compared to ASPART. So more than 74% greater insulin action within the first 30 minutes. So as I said, almost comparing it to the physiological release of insulin, 
We are not yet there, but definitely the PK and PD profile of FIAS, much, much better in terms of what you're getting, faster and better uh, action in the first 30 minutes for FIAS. And that's the critical time. If you really want to target postprandial hyperglycemia, get better postprandial hyperglycemia results and avoid late, long-term delayed hypoglycemia because of prolonged effect of the other short-acting insulins. So the late glucose lowering effect, as I said, 14 minutes faster offset of its effect and 10% smaller late glucose lowering effect with fast-acting insulin, which sometimes is responsible for avoiding the 3-hour or 4-hour post-meal hypoglycemia. We also have a, a cross-trial indirect comparison between insulin aspart versus insulin uh, versus human insulin. So the first one is aspart when it was developed as an improvisation over human regular insulin, and we see the profile there for the area under the curve. Clearly, insulin as part being better as compared to human insulin. But then you look at also the profile for fast-acting insulin as part, which is seen to be improved over the, uh, the insulin as part, and you see 74% greater uh, uh, improvement in its uh, uh, action profile over uh, insulin as part. So with innovation, what has been achieved with this new insulin? Compared with aspart, fast-acting insulin, aspart has twice as fast onset of appearance, two-fold greater early insulin exposure, 74% greater insulin action within the first 30 minutes. So the overall action profile is going to be almost similar. It's just that there is a shift to the left. So when we say 74% greater insulin action, it's not 74% greater insulin action over aspart. It's the 74% greater action in the first 30 minutes, and that's what is metabolically important. And retain beneficial PKPK -PK findings in special populations also, including those with type 1 diabetes. So this clinical development, does it have any clinical relevance for you and me? How does this affect our treatment approach? Fast-acting insulin as part has been rationally designed via formulation improvement to increase its absorption rate and approach the action of physiological insulin. I'm sure in years to come, there will be more attempts to even improve on this and get, get closer to the physiological insulin action. PKPD studies demonstrate a two-fold greater insulin exposure and 74% greater glucose lowering effect. The onset trials were the development trials for FIASP, uh, uh, which investigated the clinical effectiveness, safety profile, and potential benefits of fast-acting insulin as part in both the type 1 and type 2 diabetes population. And this is an overview of the FIASP developmental program. The ones that you see in blue are all the completed trials. The one in yellow is the ongoing trial. And these were in different populations of type 1 and type 2. Uh, onset 2 is a study that our site was also involved in in its development phase for FIASP. And let me share some of the uh, uh, data from on, uh, onset 1 and onset 2. So does the promise of this 74%, I've been repeating 74% greater uh, early glucose lowering effect, does it really have uh, any clinical relevance? Well, it does, and let me throw light on that. So this is data from the onset one trial design. This was in type 1 patients. You had, it was a double-blind study, insulin aspart plus insulin detamide. So in, in its uh, three arms, you had fast-acting insulin aspart, which was given at mealtime along with detamide. You had regular insulin aspart, which was given at mealtime along with detamide. And interestingly, you had a third arm where insulin aspart, the FIASP, was given post-meal along with insulin detamide. So this was for patients with type 1 diabetes on basal bolus treatment. There were key endpoints, which was looking at change in HbA1c, change in PPG increment, number of hypoglycemia episodes, and number of any treatment emergent adverse events to look at the safety profile for FIASP. So what was the PPG increment at week 26? What do we see here? Superior 2-hour postprandial control with mealtime fast-acting insulin as part versus uh, with fast-acting insulin as part versus insulin as part. So you look at the profiles both at 1R and 2R, and you see better PPG reductions with FIASP as compared to ASP. What about PPG at week 52? You again see that this is retained for FIASP. You're getting much lesser postprandial glucose excursion at uh, both 1 and 2 hours for FIASP as compared to ASPART. So all the PKPD profile, unless it shows us this clinical output, outcome, would have been ex extremely irrelevant. What about mean HbA1c over time? These are treat-to-target uh, uh, trials, so you will not get difference between the arms. The only aspect of uh, looking at HbA1c as primary outcome is to prove non-inferiority of a new insulin as compared to comparator, and that's what was achieved for FIASP, non-inferior to ASPART. What about treatment emergent hypoglycemia? Well, interestingly, no difference in hypoglycemia between ASPART and FIASP when it was used uh, at mealtime, but FIASP, given after the meal, showed lesser incidence of hypoglycemia. So probably the aspect of that flexibility 
that you can allow patients to have it even after the meal where there's uncertainty about the quantity of meal or what they're going to feel. And then the delayed hypoglycemia that happens seems to be decreased in the FIASP arm when it's used even post-meal. So conclusions from onset one, fast-acting insulin as part effectively improved glycemic control in subjects with type 1 diabetes, non-inferiority in A1C reduction, at week 26, superior postprandial control. At week 52, a statistically significant difference was observed for the one-hour postprandial increment. No statistical significant difference in overall rate of hypoglycemia and similar safety profile for uh, all the three arms. Now let's look at the onset two trial design, which was in type two diabetes patients. Here, you have patients with type two diabetes who are already on basal insulin and metformin, along with other oral anti-diabetic drugs. You have the initial phase of the insulin glargine. Uh, there is optimization of glargine along with metformin. The other OHAs are removed. And then you have the two arms, which is fast-acting insulin aspart along with glargine plus metformin. Or you have insulin aspart along with glargine and metformin. So these two arms, uh, which is compared for 26 weeks. Again, inclusion criteria of type 2 diabetes more than six months. Uh, standard inclusion criteria that we have, A1C 7 to 9.5 and um, key endpoints being HbA1c, 2-hour PPG increment, number of hypoglycemia, and any other adverse events. So in terms of the onset 2 data, PPG increment at week 26. This also included the meal test, uh, the uh, pre-specified meal test, which was the subjects were subjected to. Significantly greater reduction at 1 hour with fast-acting insulin aspart versus uh, regular insulin aspart. Also, in terms of mean HbA1c over time, again, similar to onset one, no difference between the HbA1c outcomes uh, in, in a treat to target. So non-inferiority, again, confirmed in the type 2 diabetic population. So the conclusions from onset two, fast-acting insulin as part effectively improved glycemic control in type 2 diabetes subjects. Non-inferiority of fast-acting insulin as part versus conventional insulin as part confirmed for change in HbA1c. Postprandial glucose regulation, 1R PPG incrementally significantly improved versus conventional as part. Two hour postprandial increment not significantly improved versus conventional. So you, in type two diabetic patients, you're seeing better results at the end of one hour and non-significant results at the end of two hours. No statistically significant difference in overall hypoglycemia, no difference in terms of the safety profile. So the practical considerations for FIASP for you and me to consider. What is the starting dose in type 2 diabetes patients? So believing that you're going to use it for your basal bolus therapy patient already on optimized basal therapy, you need to start with four units of FIASP at the largest meal of the day and then increase to four units with each meal as per the requirement. For how long can FIASP be stored? Well, after first opening the product, may be stored for a maximum of four weeks. Do not store ideally above 30 degrees Celsius. How to use it in IV setting? So there, it, it has been already approved for IV, there may be a debate and question about what is the need for using IV FIASP, and we'll not get into that, but it is, in case one needs to, it's, it already has a label for IV usage as well. So in terms of comparison between fast-acting insulin aspart and insulin aspart, the label comparison in India, well, it is approved for administration in IV for pumps and for subcutaneous use, just like aspart is. Special populations, limited in very elderly population, more than 75, but, and, and in pediatric population yet, uh, there is limits, but otherwise for pregnancy, renal and hepatic impairment, especially in pregnancy, FIASP has similar labeling to ASPART. So summary of the clinical benefits, fast acting clinical, as, clinical ASPART versus insulin ASPART. Let's remember, faster action offers better control of postprandial glycemia and HbA1c, significant superior reduction in post-meal glucose values. It has been found to be as safe as insulin ASPART, which we've been using for last several years. Approved and safe in pregnancy, renal and hepatic impairment and pumps. And just like uh, in renal uh, uh, patients with the renal dysfunction where we want to use the shorter acting insulin, I think FIASP again has an advantage there over ASPART where you want to avoid hypoglycemia in those patients. Easy to use, converting patients from another mealtime insulin can be done unit to unit. So whether you're shifting from any other <clears throat> fast acting or regular insulin, it's a unit to unit conversion for FIASP. Flexibility of meal dosing, fast acting insulin ASPART can actually be administered after a meal within 20 minutes of the meal. So that's an added advantage for FIASP, right? Thank you so much for the patient hearing. Open to questions at this time. Thank you, Dr. Manoj.